The only reason I'm here today is because I believe it is not an understatement to say that what is at stake is our understanding of the gospel, the centrality of the cross, the role of the church, and the nature of our missionary mandate. If we don't see Jesus in the Hebrew scriptures, we're not reading them correctly. This is the theological foundation of this movement. It's scary and it's dangerous, it's pessimistic, it's apocalyptic, and we need to refute it. I want to ask you a question, in fact, a number of unanswered questions to begin with. What subject do Christians find most controversial? Is it abortion, sex, climate change? Well, the correct answer is probably Israel. No other subject in ignites such strong emotions. Why is there such a close relationship today between the Christian right, the American political establishment, and the state of Israel? Why, after 40 years, does Israel continue to occupy territory in Lebanon, the Sheba Farms, uh, Syria, the Golan Heights, Palestine, the West Bank, while Syria is pressured to withdraw from Lebanon? Why is Israel the subject of more UN resolutions than any other country in the world? And why has your good government vetoed virtually every one of them? Why will you not find a single serving American uh, congressman or senator openly critical of Israel? And why has Britain and America been the focus for so much hatred from the Islamist world? I said Islamist. Uh, why, out of, uh, why are our countries a target uh, for Islamist uh, terrorism despite our commitment to the rule of international law, democracy, and human rights? Well, the answer to these questions will remain inexplicable and unanswerable unless we factor in what is probably the most destructive, controversial, and influential movement within Christendom today. But before we look at Christian Zionism, I want to just give you a few definitions of Jewish Zionism. The Jewish Virtual Library says Jewish Zionism is a national movement for the return of the Jewish people to their homeland and the resumption of Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel. Now that national movement is recognized in international law, it has been endorsed by the United Nations and is a given, and I certainly would support that. But when you move into the religious dimension of Zionism, you find people like Rabbi uh, Shlomo Avinus saying we should not forget the supreme purpose of the gathering of the exiles and the establishment of our state is the building of the temple. The temple is at the very top of the pyramid. Or Rabbi Israel Mirda, another settler uh, rabbi, says it is all a matter of sovereignty. He who controls the Temple Mount controls Jerusalem. He who controls Jerusalem controls the land of Israel. And if the land was taken in 48, that's recognized in international law. If Jerusalem was occupied in 67, and that is as yet still unresolved and is uh, an issue upon which the United Nations has repeatedly spoken, you won't find a single uh, international embassy in Jerusalem for that reason. The world does not recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and why the temple itself is under continuous threat. Uh, sorry, the Dome of the Rock is under continuous threat with the aim of the religious Jews to rebuild their temple. Where does Christian Zionism fit into this? Well, I'll give you a couple of definitions, give you an idea of the significance of the movement, and then a little bit of history, and then I want to move more onto the, uh, the political dimension of this movement. And if we want to engage with the theology, we can do that in the question time. Don Wagner, a uh, professor at North Park in Chicago, says evangelical Christian Zionism is a political movement within Protestant fundamentalist Christianity that views the modern state of Israel as the fulfillment of biblical prophecy, thus deserving our unconditional economic, moral, political, and theological support. And Grace Halsell, in her book, Forcing God's Hand, defines it in this way. Every act taken by Israel is orchestrated by God and should be condoned, supported, or even praised by the rest of us. Christian Zionists are convinced that God blesses those nations that stand with Israel and curses those who don't. Uh, Christian Zionism as a movement is deeply distrustful of the United Nations, European community, and actively opposes the implementation of international law and the right of the Palestinians to a sovereign state. 
Let me give you a flavor of the movement and its significance. John Hagee spoke in Everett a couple of weeks ago. He's the founder and senior pastor of Cornerstone Church, 18,000 member evangelical church, San Antonio, Texas. He broadcasts on national radio TV, on 160 TV stations, 50 radio stations, eight networks, with an estimated 99 million homes on a weekly basis. I call that influence. In 2006, he founded Christians United for Israel, KUFI, with the support of 400 other Christian leaders. This is what he wrote. For 25, almost 26 years now, I have been pounding the evangelical community over television. The Bible is a very pro-Israel book. If the Christian admits, I believe the Bible, I can make him a pro-Israel supporter, or they will have to denounce their faith. So I have the Christians over a barrel, you might say. Now, the assumption Hagee makes that Bible-believing Christians will be pro-Israel is the dominant view among evangelical Christians, especially in America. In March this year, he was a guest speaker at the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee policy conference, and he began with these words. The sleeping giant of Christian Zionism has awakened. There are 50 million Christians standing up and applauding the state of Israel. As the Jerusalem Post pointed out, his speech did not lack clarity. People love clarity. He went on to warn, it is 1938, Iran is Germany, and Ahmadinejad is the new Hitler. We must stop Iran's nuclear threat and stand boldly with Israel, the only democracy in the Middle East. Think of our potential future together. 50 million evangelicals joining in common cause with 5 million Jewish people in America on behalf of Israel is a match made in heaven. Well, there is an elephant in the room. There is a big elephant in this room and in every room where the discussion focuses on Israel. I think you're beginning to see why this is an important and uh, controversial subject. But the giant elephant in the middle of the room uh, is anti-Semitism. And it's time that Christians dealt with it and acknowledge our guilt, our need to repent, and to move on because the fear of being labeled anti-Semitic has kept too many Christians under our beds. While not all Christian Zionists endorse an apocalyptic future, the movement as a whole is nevertheless leading the West and the church with it into a confrontation with Islam, using biblical terminology to justify a preemptive global war against the axis of evil, merely reinforces stereotypes, fuels extremism, incites fundamentalism and increases the likelihood of a nuclear holocaust. From a theological perspective, to offer a critique, a critique of Christian Zionism is not anti-Semitism. We should repudiate uh, any form of racism, any form of hatred of a people group, be they Jews or Muslims. It is an understatement, I believe, and the only reason I'm here and not having a day off today, uh, Monday's my day off too, the only reason I'm here today is because I believe it is not an understatement to say that what is at stake is our understanding of the gospel, the centrality of the cross, the role of the church, and the nature of our missionary mandate. Now let's begin with the roots of Zionism. Uh, Christian Zionism, or proto-Zionism, preceded Jewish Zionism by 30 or 40 years at least. The rise of Christian Zionism as a movement can be traced to the 19th century, a group of British Christian leaders who began to distinguish in, in scripture uh, God's plan for the Jewish people apart from the church. You can trace it back to the Puritans and the belief that the Jews would be converted to Christ and then return to Palestine as a Christian nation. That was the hope of the, uh, the great revivals, the great awakenings. The post-millennialism saw a global church which included Jewish believers. With the apocalyptic uh, early 19th century, the rise of Napoleon, for example, uh, and, and, the, uh, and the pogroms against the Jews, there was a, a transformation in British Christian uh, society within which the end of the world was predicted uh, with some precision and, uh, and a variety of individuals, including Napoleon, uh, were identified as the Antichrist. 
And the optimism of the awakenings, the post-millennialism of the great revivals, was replaced within a generation with a pessimistic pre-millennial eschatology that was futurist in the sense that they began to stack up Old Testament promises and said they are coming true today. You can even identify the early Pentecostals, not with the 1910s and Azusa Street, but with the 1820s and this same group of Christian leaders. Now, Napoleon was the first uh, world statesman to promise the Jews a homeland. He needed Jewish money, he needed Jewish support in Palestine to neutralize Britain's foreign uh, policy agenda for the world. He wanted to cut off uh, Britain from its trade routes to India and Africa. And he set the agenda for the other European powers who, having beaten France, were fighting each other to control the world as well. And so you find in the middle to the uh, latter part of the 19th century, uh, these religious ideas, along with political expediency, blending with British foreign policy. Finney, for example, predicted Jesus would return by 1838. Uh, Edward Irving, uh, a Scottish uh, uh, Church of Scotland pastor, along with um, John Nelson Darby, and uh, a number of others began to uh, hold conferences. Uh, they became known as the Albury Circle and then the Powers Court Conferences, predicting the end of the world, the revival of uh, the Jewish people back in the land, and the destiny of the church linked to uh, this uh, worldview. Darby, for example, along with uh, Moody, and Cyrus Schofield, Darby made five or six trips to the States in the 1850s, 1860s. He had a profound influence over Moody, uh, James Brooks, William Blackstone, Cyrus Schofield, and what became known as dispensationalism, the idea that God has two chosen peoples, the church and Israel, with their own scripture texts, their own uh, destiny, uh, came to replace the traditional view of covenantalism. Covenantalism teaching that God has one people, two covenants, replaced with the idea that God has two peoples and uh, two covenants, a heavenly and an earthly people. Blackstone, one of the disciples of uh, Derby, was uh, famous for what's known as the Blackstone Memorial. He got 400 leading Christian and Jewish uh, politicians, bankers, and, uh, and industrialists uh, to sign a declaration urging uh, the American president to return the Jews to Palestine, linking it to Bible prophecy and God's continued blessing of the American people. Schofield's reference Bible, based on Darby's novel ideas, became the, the, the most popular study Bible, at least uh, by the 1950s. Dallas Theological Seminary, founded by uh, Schofield, uh, became the foremost theological seminary propounding uh, these ideas. Back in Britain, as I said, the, coal the, the coalescing of these religious ideas with political ideas uh, came to a head through Lord Shaftesbury. Uh, Lord Shaftesbury, uh, a very influential politician, uh, came to the conviction that it was Britain's destiny to return the Jews to Palestine and fulfill the church's responsibility. When his widowed mother-in-law married Lord Palmerston, who was the Foreign Secretary, uh, Shaftesbury was convinced that Britain was being blessed by God and would fulfill her heritage, her destiny. He took out page adverts in the London Times and other journals calling upon uh, Christians uh, in Europe to get behind the restoration of the Jews to Palestine. Herzl's phrase, a land of no people for a people of no land, was probably borrowed from Lord Shaftesbury, who a generation earlier had described Palestine as a country without a nation, for a nation without a country. The First World Zionist Congress held in Basel, uh, three Christian Zionists were present. William Heschler was the Episcopal chaplain to the uh, British Embassy in Vienna, and he facilitated uh, the uh, opportunities for Herzl and others to meet with the leaders of uh, governments in Europe and to lobby on behalf of the Zionist movement. Again, William Heschler's book, The Restoration of the Jews to Palestine, preceded Herzl's 
by two years. And Herzl's diary records meetings with Heschler. Uh, I remember Herzl was uh, largely skeptical of religious matters. Uh, he described this uh, uh, Anglican vicar uh, in these terms, a sympathetic, gentle fellow with a long gray beard of a prophet, enthusiastic about my solution to the Jewish question. He considers my movement a prophetic turning point, which he had foretold two years before, uh, predicting the settling uh, of Palestine in 1897. We have prepared the ground for you, said Heschler triumphantly. I take him as a naive visionary. He gives me excellent advice, full of unmistakable, genuine goodwill. He is at once clever and mystical, cunning and naive. Everything that you long for in your local parish priest. Uh, remember, this is what uh, Herzl is describing the Anglican vicar. Uh, we have prepared the ground for you. We Christians have prepared the ground for you, Jews. David Lloyd George was converted to Zionism through acetone. Uh, Chaim Weizmann was a chemist working at Manchester University. We were uh, locked in, in, in conflict with uh, Germany, and uh, Weizmann gave the British uh, acetone, a form of uh, synthetic TNT, and it helped us uh, defeat Germany uh, in the First World War. Uh, James Arthur Balfour, uh, probably the most influential Christian Zionist of the 19th century, saw uh, his role uh, and British uh, politics as an instrument for carrying out the divine purpose. Uh, you may not know, but it's a fact of history that the Balfour Declaration was written by the Zionist organization. It, was, uh, it went through several drafts. Uh, they expected the British government to create uh, Israel as a state. Uh, Britain's agenda, if you know something of British history, was to bless the peoples of the world in the British Empire. We had no plans to allow anyone to become independent. We'd lost America. We weren't going to lose anyone else. And, uh, and therefore, we were offering the Jews a homeland. We were not offering them a state. We were offering them the blessing of the British Empire. And it took us uh, 40 years to figure out they didn't want that. Um, but interestingly, you have the famous Balfour Declaration where we promised the Jews a homeland. We promised uh, to respect the rights of the Palestinians. And uh, we promised also Jews living in other parts of the world that they didn't have to go and live in Palestine because they were anti-Semites who used the Balfour Declaration to get rid of the Jews. Interestingly, again, it's a historical fact. The Balfour Declaration was published prematurely to beat the Germans because the Germans were about to do the same. The Germans and the British in the middle of the First World War were both turning to the Jews to help them beat the other side in the same way that the French and the British used the Jews to try and defeat the other side in the Napoleonic Wars. So we got in first. But just think what history might have happened if Germany had promised the Jews a homeland in 1918. The consequences of the Shoah might have been different. But this is confession time. Uh, British Prime Minister, for in Palestine, we do not propose even to go through the former consulting the wishes of the present inhabitants of the country. The four great powers are committed to Zionism, and Zionism, be it right or wrong, good or bad, is rooted in age-long traditions, in present needs, in future hopes of far, far profounder import than the desires or prejudices of the 700,000 Arabs who now inhabit that ancient land. As far as Palestine is concerned, the powers have made no statement of fact which is not admittedly wrong, and no declaration of policy, which at least in the letter we haven't always intended to violate. And the reason for that is because Britain and France had agreed secretly we were going to split the Middle East. The British and the French had agreed in 1915 to, uh, to split the Middle East after they'd beaten the Germans. So we had no intention of giving Palestine either to the Jews or the Arabs. Uh, we were promising the French we were going to keep it to ourselves. This is the corruption of empire. Uh, the British mandate was an attempt to contain and limit uh, the rights of Israeli Jews and Palestinian Arabs uh, to enjoy the benefits of the British empire. We were trying to work out a solution, and it took us 40 years to figure out the partition plan of 1947, where we we're going to split Palestine between the Jews and the Arabs, as you know. The, uh, the Israelis, the Jews, accepted that plan. The Arabs rejected it. The War of uh, 48 led to the armistice lines, to the War of 67, and to contemporary, uh, the contemporary situation. 
What's happened since 67? Well, 67 was the trigger. Within the evangelical world, uh, Christianity Today, Nelson Bell was the editor, uh, father-in-law of Billy Graham, uh, seeing uh, the Six-Day War as a sign, prophecy is coming true. Jimmy Carter, 78, again, seeing the state of Israel as the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. He's done a 180-degree turn since then, but in 2003, the Pew Research Center showed that 63% of American white evangelicals agree with that statement. Coalition developed in 76 between an evangelical president, Menachem Begin, a right-wing uh, prime minister, and Jerry Falwell. Coalition emerged, uh, and, and through the strength of that tripartite coalition, significant things happened in the American scene. Uh, Jerry Falwell was the suitor for that relationship. In uh, 1979, the Israeli government gave him a Learjet uh, to assist him in his advocacy work on behalf of Israel. Uh, in 1980, uh, Carter was replaced by Ronald Reagan because Carter became increasingly distrustful of, uh, of the Israeli agenda in the occupied territories. Reagan himself uh, was strongly committed to a dispensational theological framework. 81, when Begin was bombing uh, the power stations in Iraq to neutralize Iraq's uh, aspirations to, re uh, to obtain uh, nuclear technology, he phoned Falwell first, before he phoned the president, to explain to the Christian public the reasons for the bombing. Uh, later, when uh, Israel was uh, uh, reported in your press as being complicit in the uh, massacres in 82 in uh, Sabra and Shatila, uh, Falwell uh, responded, it is uh, just propaganda. Reagan, in the 1980 speeches, used the word Armageddon over 20 times in his election speeches. In 84, uh, speaking to Tom Dine from APAC, he said, you know, I turn back to the ancient prophets, uh, the Old Testament signs for telling Armageddon, and I find myself wondering if we're the generation that is going to see it come about. While George Bush Sr. and Clinton and George W. Bush have not shared the same theological presuppositions of Carter or Reagan, they have nevertheless maintained the same strong pro-Zionist stance of their predecessors, and that is largely due to the influence of the Christian Zionist lobby. In 50 years of service to Israel, Jerry Falwell succeeded probably better than any other American Christian leader to ensure that his followers recognized their Christian duty to God involves providing unconditional support to the state of Israel. 70 million conservative Christians he uh, claimed to have access to with 200,000 pastors on his database. He, along with uh, Pat Robertson, John Hagee, Mike Evans, Tim LaHaye, Franklin Graham, many others, represent a coalition of over 300 of the leading Christian leaders in America today. Again, we know in the year 2000, uh, Bush uh, was re-elected uh, with the support of 40% uh, of evangelical Protestants. What is this, the size and significance of this movement? Well, post 9-11, that movement has grown. There's been this convergence of the neocons, the Christian right, the military industry, and the pro-Israeli lobby to influence and control uh, Bush's foreign policy. Dale Crowley is a Washington journalist. He suggests 25, 30 million Christian Zionists support this movement. Uh, the Pew Research Center suggests it's somewhat higher and Falwell's own statistics even higher still. 80,000 pastors, 1,000 radio stations, 100 TV stations, 250 Christian Zionist organizations founded since 1980 alone. I hope you're beginning to see why this movement is powerful. It is a dominant force in American uh, political circles, and it is the reason we are in the mess we are in the Middle East today. Unity Coalition for Israel is just one of these organizations. Over 200 different organizations, three of the largest international Christian embassy, Christian Friends of Israel, Bridges for Peace. They alone have 40 million active members. I get their weekly emails and they tell me to send my uh, 
prescribed letter to the president urging him to lay off the settlements, to justify the separation wall, to nuke Iran. Dale Crowley says it is the fastest growing cult in America today. That's the family tree showing the uh, British uh, line of the family. A restorationism, the idea that the Jews would be restored to Palestine. It is essentially still covenantal uh, and premillennialist in Britain. In the States, it has transmuted into dispensationalism in at least three types, messianic, apocalyptic, and political. You have the messianic, people like Jews for Jesus, who have an evangelistic agenda, but are also committed to a political agenda. You have the apocalyptic Christian Zionists. They sell the books. They are the most influential in terms of getting to our church members. And those are the books which you will find in Christian bookstores. I was speaking to the staff of InterVarsity Press uh, last week, and uh, I was uh, selling a new book, which I, I produced for IVP coming out this summer. The uh, booksellers themselves, the book marketeers for IVP, uh, confided and said, the struggle they face is that these are the books that pay the salaries of the bookshop owners. They have to sell these books because it's the only way they make a living. They are literally forcing God's hand. Well, the theology of this movement, and we don't have time really to unpack this in my presentation, we can do a bit more in the questions, uh, is essentially a seven-fold uh, theological package. It's based on a very ultra-literalistic biblical hermeneutic, uh, the idea that every passage of Scripture is of equal validity today. Each passage of Scripture is, uh, must be literally interpreted. On the basis of that, the Jews remain God's chosen people. They are being restored to greater Israel, from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates. Jerusalem is their eternal capital. The temple will be rebuilt. Uh, those who stand in the way of this agenda are working with the Antichrist, and there will be a war of Armageddon. And not all Christian Zionists subscribe to this theology uh, in, with equal force, but that is the composite uh, of this uh, theological movement. Its literalistic hermeneutic is based on a critique of covenantalism. Covenantalism is a historic position of the Church of England, uh, the Presbyterian Church, uh, even the Baptist Church. The idea that God has one people, one faith, two covenants. Uh, Jesus will return and we will be with him in eternity. There will be a new heaven and a new earth and we can remain agnostic as to whether we are amillennial, premillennial, postmillennial, or panmillennial, or transmillennial, or preterist, or any one of a number of permutations on those. What dispensationalists did through Schofield's Reference Bible, through Darby's teaching and others, is they took the Bible literally, word for word, verse for verse, passage for passage, and therefore promises that relate to the Jewish people apply today with equal validity. So in place of this covenantal scheme uh, between the present age of the church and eternity, they have placed a significant role for Israel, a secret rapture, which you won't find in Scripture, or predating 1820, and then a tribulation, a period of seven years or three and a half years of, uh, of apocalyptic war on earth, a battle of Armageddon, and a millennium, invariably. So these ingredients have been placed in between the present and the future. And so God has two peoples, a heavenly people and an earthly people, the Jews. And so promises in the Hebrew scriptures about Israel, Jerusalem, and the temple are applied to today as if the coming of Jesus was a parenthesis. The church is a parenthesis, said uh, John Nelson Darby. Or as Gilbert Blazekian from Wheaton says, is the church the bride of Christ or the concubine of Christ? Were the promises made to the Jews fulfilled in Jesus or postponed? By Jesus. That's the difference between the mainline position of the churches and dispensationalism. The way uh, covenantalists view the Bible is that we read the Hebrew scriptures through the eyes of Jesus. And I suggest that is the way in which Jesus has taught us to read the Hebrew scriptures. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. 
If we don't see Jesus in the Hebrew Scriptures, we're not reading them correctly. You diligently study the Scriptures, he said to the Pharisees, because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the Scriptures that testify about me. And so Jesus must be central to our uh, understanding of the Hebrew Scriptures. Hebrews 8, the whole book of Hebrews, is designed to help Jewish believers understand the relationship between Jesus and the Old Testament. Hebrews 8, 13 is a defining statement. By declaring this covenant, new has made the first one obsolete. What is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. Jews remain God's chosen people. The idea within, within dispensationalism is that God has two chosen people, so heavenly and an earthly people. On the basis of those two foundational presuppositions, the Jews are being restored to greater Israel. Eter uh, Jerusalem will be their eternal capital. The Jewish temple must be rebuilt. And antipathy toward Arabs and Islam because they are in the way. And then there will be a war of Armageddon to sort it out. And if you go to the website of people like Jack Van Impey, you can print off the maps that will show you how uh, the end of the world is going to take place. You can go to the uh, Rapture Ready website and they will uh, list the signs of Armageddon, the, uh, the signs in scripture as they see it, and uh, they will even give you a, 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 a variety of potential antichrists, and they will rate them on the likelihood of these individuals. Kofi Annan was the, the hottest contender until he, uh, until he retired. But you can print off the maps that will show you how uh, Europe will uh, be on uh, the side of the antichrist, and the black line in the Mediterranean is the American Sixth Fleet coming to the rescue of uh, Israel. This is the theological foundation of this movement. It's scary and it's dangerous, it's pessimistic, it's apocalyptic, and we need to uh, refute it. The question, as I said, is what difference did the coming of Jesus Christ make? Was it the postponement or the fulfillment of those promises made to the Jews? What I want to do in the brief time I've got left is give you a, a flavor of the politics of this movement. Um, tonight, uh, in the presentation I'm giving, I'm going to look at the scriptures as well. But I want to give you a flavor for the politics of this movement. If we believe the Jews remain God's chosen people, and we place them on a pedestal above other nations, then we must support Israel when it's criticized. If we believe the Jews are being restored to Palestine and it's God's will, then we must fund it. We must facilitate it. If we believe that they are entitled to everything from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates, then the settlements are the front line. We've got to support them. If we believe that Jerusalem is their capital, then we must recognize it. If the temple is going to be rebuilt, then let's get on with it. If the future is apocalyptic, then we must oppose any peace process that forces Israel to compromise land for peace. Let's look at these one at a time. Christianity Today did a survey recently. They found that one in four readers of Christianity Today see it as their responsibility to support the state of Israel. Pew Research Center uh, showed uh, a significant proportion of uh, Christians in America believe it's their responsibility to sympathize more with Israel than the Palestinians. Hal Lindsay lamenting that 62% of UN resolutions, at least up to the Gulf War, condemned Israel. Therefore, our Christian Zionist friends see it as their responsibility to stand with Israel. Uh, when Ariel Sharon made his provocative visit to the Haram al-Sharif, uh, the Jews for Jesus took out a full-page advert in the New York Times uh, uh, calling upon Christians to stand with Israel. Uh, our hearts are heavy as we watch the images of violence and bloodshed in the Middle East, and I'm sure your heart was heavy, uh, and you would want to stand with, uh, with both sides, but they called upon Christians to support Israel, not peace, not justice, not reconciliation, but Israel. Uh, the lobbying on Capitol Hill is intense. The International Christian Embassy was founded uh, with the express purpose of lobbying your political leadership. The Unity Coalition for Israel uh, is the largest group now uh, uh, seeking to achieve this. Uh, 40 million active members ensuring that your government continues to fund uh, the, the settlements uh, through loan guarantees and 
military hardware. Zeev Chafetz, uh, writing in the New York Times in 2005, said, in the last eight years, an estimated 40,000, 400,000 born-again donors have sent Rabbi Yikhail Eckstein, who's with the settler movement, about a quarter of a billion dollars for Jewish courses of his personal choosing. No Jew since Jesus has come under this kind of Gentile following. It was in the New York Times. And the last American president to openly criticize Israel was George Bush Sr. In, uh, in uh, I think it was 2000, no, 1991, sorry, 1991. Uh, he tried to put pressure on Israel to, uh, to limit its expansion of the settlements, and he tried to link the loan guarantees with a freeze on the settlements. He, uh, he urged Israel not to retaliate against Iraqi attacks. Uh, attacks. He promised Arab coalition partners he would deal with the Palestinian issue. And this is what he said. He said this, quote, and this is taken uh, from uh, Michael Lind, who's a political analyst. He said, there are a thousand lobbies on the Hill today lobbying Congress for loan guarantees for Israel, and I am one lonely little guy down here asking Congress to delay its consideration of loan guarantees for 120 days. The most powerful man in the world saying, I'm a lonely little guy. Pressure your presidents are under. And what about Bill Clinton? In case you are a Democrat, uh, Michael Lind describes Clinton's last day in office as the greatest abuse of presidential pardon power in American history. What did Bill Clinton do as he cleaned out his office on his last day? He pardoned Mark Rich, who was on the FBI's most wanted list for tax uh, evasion, uh, a, a billionaire. And uh, how does Clinton justify uh, pardoning a fugitive billionaire? He said this, again, in the New York Times, February 2001, many present and former high-ranking Israeli officials of both major parties, leaders of Jewish communities in America, pardon, urged the pardon of Mr. Rich because of his services to Israeli charitable causes, to Mossad's efforts to rescue Jews from hostile countries, and to the peace process. So there you have it. Solidarity tours to Israel, another way in which they show uh, strong support for Israel. If you uh, were fortunate enough to go on one of Falwell's tours uh, in recent years, his itinerary boasted of on-site tours of modern Israeli battlefields, official visits to Israeli defense installations, and strategic military positions, plus experience firsthand the battle Israel faces as a nation. And this is on a pilgrimage, supporting Israel. Second plank of this movement's political agenda is facilitating the Aliyah. With the fall of communism since 1980, a coalition of Christian Zionist agencies have taken the initiative in encouraging Jewish people to emigrate to Israel seeing this as the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Exabus is probably uh, the first Christian agency to uh, begin this work. Uh, founded in 1984, uh, they have 80 team members working across Russia, 40 vehicles, 16 bases, and they are facilitating over 1,200 Jews to return to Israel on a monthly basis. Uh, the International Christian Embassy on their website boasts of having funded over 40,000 uh, immigrants, uh, most of them, in fact, many of them on sponsored flights. And the way these organizations work is that they identify small Jewish communities in, uh, in Russia, they, uh, they show them videos of idyllic lives in Israel, they persuade them to emigrate, obtain documents to prove their Jewish origins, distribute humanitarian packages, pay for exit permits, passports, debt repayment, transport, accommodation, clothing, food, and then they will help them resettle in Palestine, and they do it using Christian money to do this. And they describe it as fishing, fulfilling the role Jesus gave the church to be fishers of men. What about Eretz Israel, sustaining the settlements? For uh, Jewish and Christian Zionists, the legitimate borders of Israel are from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates. They include much of, the, uh, of Egypt, of Lebanon, Syria, Iraq. The third international uh, congress are on uh, the third international Christian Zionist congress in 1996. Uh, a, a long uh, statement was made on uh, dec uh, Christian Zionism, which included this statement: "The land of Israel has been given to the Jewish people of God as an everlasting possession, 
by an eternal covenant. They have an absolute right to possess and dwell in the land, including Judea, Samaria, Gaza, and the Golan. The way in which this agenda is applied is through adopting the settlements. And if you go to the website of Christian Friends of Israeli Communities, you will see that how they define settlements, a piece of land where brave Jewish pioneers have taken up residence, uh, recreating the ancient Jewish civilization. They link uh, uh, is illegal Israeli settlements with Christian churches in America, uh, South Africa, Germany, Holland, and so you get these mega churches adopting a settlement, sponsoring them, funding them, praying for them, supporting them, visiting them. Hard to believe, but it's happening. Uh, International Christian Embassy raising money for bulletproof buses to enable the settlers to move in and out of their settlements freely. Justifying the separation wall. I had a debate recently in the British press uh, with a representative of a Zionist organization who lamented that for the first time in history, the Jews were putting ourselves into a ghetto. And I had to try and point out that the root of the wall suggested a ghetto for the Palestinians, not for the Jewish people. Fourthly, the belief that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. How do you get the world community to recognize Israel as Jerusalem, as the capital of Israel? Just think about it. How, how would you get the world community to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of of Israel. Easy. You move the American Embassy. It's as simple as that. You buy the bit of land, you build a building, you call it the American Embassy, and de facto, Jerusalem becomes capital of Jerusalem because everyone's got to move their embassy because we all have to deal with the Americans. And so Senator Bob Dole has led the crusade until he retired uh, to get legislation through the Senate requiring the U.S. Embassy to be rebuilt in Jerusalem. And that legislation was passed on three occasions. It had to be built on the first occasion by the 31st of May 1999. $100 million was allocated for preliminary spending. In October 1995, he said, Israel's capital is not on the table of the peace process. That's pretty Orwellian logic. Moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem does nothing to prejudice the outcome of future negotiations. Prejudice is everything. Uh, and that's the reason why George Bush Sr., uh, Bill Clinton, and George W. Bush have refused to sign off on that legislation. Jerusalem, he said, should remain forever the eternal undivided capital of the state of Israel. The time has come to enact legislation to get the job done, and there will be increasing pressure to achieve this, funded and supported by the Christian right. Uh, over uh, 10 of the largest evangelical leaders in America, including Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, and many others, uh, took out a full-page advert in the, London, in the New York Times in 1997, 10 years ago, uh, calling upon American Christians to join in uh, supporting what they described as a holy mission. The battle for Jerusalem has begun. begun. It is time for believers in Christ to support our Jewish brethren. What was this holy mission? To move the embassy to Jerusalem. Because that's the way to get Jerusalem recognized as the capital of Israel. Fifthly, what about the temple? Well, within uh, Christian Zionism and within religious Jewish Zionism is the belief that the temple must be rebuilt if the Messiah is to return. And, uh, and so you've got people like Hal Lindsay uh, insisting that preparations are being made to rebuild the Jewish temple. And uh, Mike uh, Randall Price, uh, his 735 page the coming last day's temple will tell you everything you need to know about how to rebuild a temple and who's trying to organize it, names and addresses of organizations you can send your donation dollars to. And uh, Gershon Solomon is one of his friends. He's the controversial figurehead of the Temple Mount Faithful. He's often a guest at Christian churches uh, in America. In 1998, uh, he said this, the mission of the present generation is to liberate the Temple Mount and remove, I repeat, remove the defiling abomination there. That's the Dome of the Rock. He says this, the Israeli government must do it. We must have a war. The Messiah will not come by himself. We must bring him by fighting. 
Now that resonates considerably with the zealots of the first century and with some of our Christian Zionist friends today. According to Grace Halsell, between 1967 and 1990, there were over 100 armed assaults on the Haram al-Sharif. And she says, in no instance did any Israeli prime minister or chief rabbi criticize those attacks. And every year, uh, the Temple Mount faithful seek to move two large three and a half ton stones onto the Temple Mount to begin the rebuilding work. There they are. And every year, they get a bit closer. And this last year, the Israeli authorities allowed them to get very close to the Temple Mount. Now, if you are uh, uh, familiar with the Book of Numbers, uh, the, uh, the, the, yes, the Book of Numbers, you'll know that to, um, to uh, restart temple sacrifices, you must purify the temple, you must purify the high priest and the altar. And the dilemma is that you need the ashes of a red heifer to purify the altar before you can offer sacrifices on a purified altar. And the ashes of the red heifer were lost in AD 70, or they were hidden, and, uh, and uh, we don't publicly know where they are. So in 1998, Clyde Lott, a Pentecostal Mississippi rancher, formed the Canaan Land Restoration of Israel Incorporated for the purpose of raising livestock suitable for temple sacrifice. And according to Newsweek, in 1997, the first red heifer for 2,000 years was born at the Kafar Hisidim Kibbutz near Haifa, and she was named Melody. And the Jewish rabbis went to inspect Melody, and uh, she appeared, she was featured in Newsweek. And uh, just before they were ready to sacrifice her, unfortunately, Melody grew some gray hairs on her udder and on her tail. And she was therefore deemed ritually impure, and she probably ended up as hamburgers. But not to be uh, outdone, Clyde Lott and others are seeking to breed through artificial insemination uh, Aberdeen Anguses that will be suitable for uh, temple sacrifice. And uh, if you visit uh, the old city, the, Dru the Jewish quarter, and you visit the museum of the Temple Mount Faithful and the other uh, messianic uh, Jewish groups, you'll find that they are building the utensils and uh, creating the furniture needed for the new temple. I wish I could end there and, and we'll go away with a smile on our faces, but the future within Christian Zionism is uh, very, very pessimistic. It's based upon uh, a, a strong commitment to a US-Israeli alliance uh, Jerry Falwell once said, God has been kind to America because America has been kind to the Jew. Uh, Gary Bauer, who was a presidential candidate in the year 2000, said, terrorists don't understand why Israel and the United States are joined at the heart. Mike Evans, who founded uh, the Jerusalem prayer team along with Pat Robertson, Anne Graham Lotz, Pat Boone, John Hagee, Bill McCarthy, are committed to guard, defend, and protect the Jewish people. And in his book, uh, Israel, America's key to survival, uh, he said this, only one nation, Israel, stands between terrorist aggression and the complete decline of the United States. He says, we stand with Israel, God is going to bless America and Israel as well. If, Amer if Israel falls, the U.S. can no longer remain a democracy. Now, again, if you find it hard to follow his logic, he, uh, his latest book, The American Prophecies, it reached the New York Times bestseller list three weeks before it was published. Now you have to ask, how do you get on the New York Times bestseller list before the book's even been published? I'll tell you how he does it, because I'm on his email list as well. And uh, he's a shrewd businessman, because what he tells his supporters to do is buy three copies of his book, one from Amazon, one from Barnes & Noble, and one from another distributor, because those are the three distributors the New York Times uses for working on the bestseller list. He says, buy three copies and send them to me and then I will recycle them. I will give them away. And enough people have done that and ordered the book to justify it getting a five-star rating on Amazon. Now, you may wonder whether America is mentioned in the Bible, so I, uh, you don't need to read the book to find out. But he says, yes, it is. As a Middle East analyst and minister who's worked closely with leaders in the region for decades, 
I tended to be skeptical of attempts to come up with schemes to plug America into prophetic interpretations. But after thousands of hours of research, I'm totally convinced that America is found in prophecy, and I believe you will too after reading my book. Now, Amazon's editorial review observes that actual quotes from scripture are rather sparse. You know, you have, to, you have to give it to Amazon's editorial review. They want to sell the books, they want to make money, but they don't want to endorse the book because there aren't that many scripture references in the book, but that's how you do it. But he goes on to claim this in the book, September the 11th would never have happened if America had fought the same bigotry in the 1990s rather than trying to appease it. Millions of Jews would be living today if anti-Semitism had not been ignored in the 1920s and 30s, the Great Depression, as well as other American tragedies, happened because of America's pride and challenge to God Almighty's plan. God's almighty plan to move the American embassy back to Jerusalem, to consecrate Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, and encourage the Jews back to Palestine. That's God's almighty plan. Then Jesus can return. Christian Zionists, such as Mike Evans, John Hagee, and others, see America as the great redeemer, her superpower role in the world predicted in scripture, providentially ordained. And uh, I have to confess that uh, my predecessors in Britain felt exactly the same in the 19th century. It's just as we declined, you took over. I think it was the land lease deal we did at the end of the Second World War that tipped the balance in your favor. But um, critics, Rosemary Ruther says, this is dualistic, Manichaean view of world politics, America and Israel together against an evil world. There is strong antipathy toward Arabs within Christian Zionism. Ramon Bennett's book is a bestseller in the settlements uh, as a so-called Christian. He says the Arab is neither a vicious nor usually a calculating liar, but a natural one. Franklin Graham, writing in the Charlotte Observer in, the, uh, in uh, 16th of October 2000, said the Arabs will not be happy until every Jew is dead. They hate the state of Israel. They all hate the Jews. God gave the land to the Jews. The Arabs will never accept that. Now, he was challenged repeatedly to retract that statement, and he's refused to do so. Michael Lind observes that while anti-Semitism is taboo in America, the taboo against anti-Arab bigotry is weak. But it goes even further than that, because you find some of your leading politicians and Christian leaders justifying the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. You find people like Dave Hunt denying that Palestinians exist. They are Arabs. They can go and live somewhere else. But Palestine belongs to the Jews. Dick Army, former Republican Senate leader, made groundbreaking news justifying the forced evacuation of Palestinians. CNBC, May the 1st, 2002, in an interview with Chris Matthews, Army said, quote, and you can get this from the web, most of the people who now populate Israel were transported from all over the world to that land, and they made it their home. The Palestinians can do the same. Now, he wasn't saying the right of return. He was saying the right of removal. So when Chris Matthews said, are you justifying ethnic cleansing? Army said, we are not willing to sacrifice Israel for the notion of a Palestinian homeland. I'm content to have Israel grab the entire West Bank. And so Matthews gave Army several opportunities to clarify that he was not advocating ethnic cleansing. And uh, then he said, have you ever told George Bush, the president of your home state of Texas, that you think the Palestinians should get up and go and leave Palestine? And that's the solution. He said, quote, I'm probably telling him right now. I'm content to have those people who've been aggressors against Israel retired to some other arena. You know, Army's views that Palestinians should be retired is only the latest in a series of calls in the mainstream media for ethnic cleansing of the occupied territories. You know, there are 200,000 Palestinians caught between the Green Line, 67 border, and the wall. And uh, I don't think they're going to be offered Israeli citizenship. Still, they're on the National Review's website. We weren't punctilious about locating and punishing only Hitler and his top officials. We carpet bomb German cities. We kill civilians. That's war, and this is war. Another writer on the National Review said, lots of sentiment for nuking Mecca. Few people would die or send a signal. The time for seriousness is now. That would not go down well in Arab circles. Pat Robertson. Uh, he got into trouble uh, when he uh, suggested 
that uh, right across America you have terrorist cells that through your liberal immigration policies you've allowed into the country. Opposing the peace process, Gary Bauer described the roadmap to peace as a satanic roadmap because it forces Israel to compromise. Pat Robertson said, if the United States take East Jerusalem back and makes it the capital of the Palestinian state, we are asking for the wrath of God. And many people uh, believe that. Hal Lindsey, again, you can find this on his website, 2003, uh, in response to uh, George W. Bush's involvement in the peace process. He said, I am heartbroken uh, over this last stage of uh, the roadmap to peace, this odyssey to Holocaust, he said. He said, I was sickened to watch a well-meaning Christian American president talk incessantly about his vision. Now, you have to ask, what would make you feel sick listening to George Bush? What could he say that would make you feel sick? Well, for Hal Lindsey, it was a Palestinian and Jewish state living side by side in peace. Because it can't possibly be part of God's agenda, because it involves compromising land for peace. Forcing God's hand. I'll close with this quote from John Hagee. The United States, he said this in March this year, the United States must join Israel in a preemptive military strike against Iran to fulfill God's plan for both Israel and the West, a biblically prophesied end-time confrontation with Iran, which will lead to the rapture, tribulation, and second coming of Christ. We've heard it before. It was, it was Prussia. It was Germany. It was Russia. It was communism. It was the Arabs. It was Iraq, and now it's Iran. God help us if he gets his way. The political agenda of Christian Zionism. The danger of this theology is not so much that it is fatalistic, but that like the chicken little story, it appears so contagious. What I've tried to do is give you a flavor for some of your Christian bedfellows here in America that we live with through radio, satellite, TV, and occasional appearances in Britain. Uh, they are leading the church into an apocalyptic uh, confrontation with Islam, and they are taking us further and further and further away from the Prince of Peace and the mandate he has given us to be peacemakers. Thank you. This is a prayer written by uh, Garth Hewitt, who's a friend and it's based on a, a verse from the Talmud, 10 measures of beauty God gave to the world, nine to Jerusalem, one to the remainder. 10 measures of sorrow God gave to the world, nine to Jerusalem, one to the remainder. It speaks of the beauty, but also the tragedy of Jerusalem. And uh, he says, pray for the peace. May the justice of God fall down like fire and bring a home for the Palestinian. May the mercy of God fall down like rain and protect the Jewish people. And may the beautiful eyes of a holy God who weeps for all his children bring his healing hope to his wounded ones for the Jew and the Palestinian. Amen. Amen. I've got some more material, but I'm going to come to that if it's appropriate in the Q&A. Thank you very much for listening. I am committed to uh, the theological doctrine of the sovereignty of God. I believe that God knows what's going to happen next. And all I care about is fulfilling my responsibility and not doing his work. I want to be on the welcoming committee for the return of Christ, not the organizing committee. And I think too many of, too many of our friends are on the organizing committee. So I think we have, we have got to teach the Bible. I think the reason that Hal Lindsey and Tim LaHaye and others have have done the damage they have is because we have been reluctant to deal with eschatology and our relationship with Israel, how the Old and New Testaments fit together. We haven't been teaching the Bible, and therefore these guys have come in and stolen the show. We've got to get back to basics and teach God's will, major on the role of the church today and not play with politics. But we have got to warn our politicians not to listen to these guys. I think we've got to show, you know, before 9-11, if I was giving this presentation, I'd be saying, don't you care about the church in Palestine? They are hemorrhaging because of our foreign policy. You know, churches in the West funding the settlers is killing the church. But now since 9-11, we're not just appealing to altruism, we're appealing to vested self-interest. 
don't you realize that our deep insecurity from Islamists is because of our foreign policy? The story of Jacob is not a model for fatherhood. Jacob loved one of his sons more than his other sons, and that led to jealousy, hatred, attempted murder, and should we be so surprised that our foreign policy uh, is reaping the same uh, consequences? So we must treat uh, the Arab states and Israel the same. We must respect them, we must help them work out how to live together. We did it in Europe uh, after hundreds of years of civil war. Uh, we've learned to live together in the, in the Europe, I was going to say the United Nations of Europe, uh, the United States of Europe. Um, the same can happen. I think we must be positive and optimistic and committed to our core values and our core priorities to, uh, to know Jesus, make Jesus known, to live out his, uh, his teaching in the way we treat other people. They won't care how much we know until they know how much we care. That's our mandate. But there is an element within which we've got to challenge our brothers and sisters in Christ. This theology is not in Scripture and it's not in God's will. I don't know that I heard you say anything about the Iraq war, and I'm, uh, I'm wondering, you know, it must figure large in the whole uh, Christian Zionist uh, understanding of the Iraq. Know, preparing, yeah, the Iraq yeah. war. Oh, it preparing did. Preparing for Armageddon, it did. I yeah. assume. It did, but it doesn't now, because it's history. You see, um, the books I showed you on there, if I'd, cr if I'd put them in chronological order, you'd have seen something very interesting. You'd have seen the books in the 60s and 70s said the communists are working with the Antichrist. We've got to beat communism. Uh, we must root out communism in American society. We must uh, deal with countries that support communism. We must uh, subvert their leadership. We must, uh, you know, we must work with the Contras and so on. And so there was a theological justification for that political foreign policy. As if you trace Hal Lindsey's work, it's fascinating. Uh, He's written about five or six books. He's published 30, but he's written five or six. And every couple of years, he republishes a book with a new title, and he changes the ending. So uh, in, in uh, Late Great Planet Earth, it's the communists. In uh, There's a New World Coming and Planet Earth 2000, it's the Arab, uh, sorry, it's the communist Arab conspiracy. By the year 2000, it's the Islamists. We've forgotten about the communists. And so in the same way in the 80s and early 90s, uh, Saddam Hussein was being set up as an antichrist figure. Uh, Dave Hunt's uh, writings and, and others describe, um, describe how uh, Saddam Hussein is rebuilding Babylon. Book of Revelation mentions Babylon. If we're gonna be literalistic, Babylon isn't Rome. It's not the European community. Babylon's Babylon. Hey, Iraq is in the Bible. You know, our, our foreign policy is, is, is God's destiny, okay? So, so they were churning out books all about how even he looked like Nebuchadnezzar, you know? But when Saddam Hussein was defeated, when Iraq was, was beaten, well, we need another bad guy, so it's Iran now. So you won't find Iraq featuring very strongly. It's Iran now, because they're, the, they're the new bad guys. Um, I know that obviously you've talked about Christian Zionism particularly, is there any way that you see Christian Zionism and Jewish Zionism working together or not? Um, and conversely, um, I know there are Jews who don't support the Aliyah um, part of Judaism, the understanding. How does that or not fit into this whole big picture? Okay. Zionism um, in the uh, late 19th century, early 20th century was a secular movement, it was a socialist movement predominantly. Eastern Europeans uh, committed to socialist principles, wanting uh, to be free of uh, pogroms and, and start a new life. So you had the Kibbutzim and you had, you had the, 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 the foundation of, uh, of Zionism was a, uh, was a socialist experiment. Uh, from the 60s with Begin, it became predominantly a religious movement, using biblical terminology to rename the settlements, to reclaim the land. And he tapped into, if you like, the, 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 the love of scripture among the Christian right and resonated. And some good PR work was done on how do you tap into the American power base? You talk about the Bible coming true. 
know, you can be cynical, but that's what happened. So today, Zionism is largely a political move, a, a religious political movement, and an extreme political movement. Um, the, the, the political structure of, of Israel today is such that the minority political parties dominate the government because the government needs a coalition. And so they give the strategic uh, 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 roles to the extremist parties. Um, so the extreme right always wins, whoever, whether it's the Kud or, or the Labour Party, they always have to work with the extremists. And the settlement movement is predominantly religious. When you hear about the yeshiva in Hebron, it's a religious school training the priests for the temple. They're not, they're not training rabbis for reformed synagogues. They're training priests for a new temple. So um, the solidarity is with the religious right within, within the Christian community. And so you've got solidarity on the, on the temple movement, the settlement movement are the two key ones, I would say. Now this is clearly disavowed by um, secular Jews and some religious Jews who are, are more committed to waiting for the Messiah to build his kingdom and, uh, and who are committed to human rights and justice. Uh, and, and those are clearly the groups that we work closely with uh, to seek to neutralize this marriage. Um, it's a good question. The Arab community in America is larger than the Jewish community, but historically they've never been uh, connected integrated. They represent uh, uh, different nationalities as well as tribal uh, communities, whereas there's a strong solidarity with the Jewish community focused on Israel. I think that the, because of the destructive influence of this movement I've described, the Arab world has tended to demonize America in the way that we demonize them, and therefore they haven't had much interest in trying to influence the demons. They just want to, you know, exercise the demons. So, uh, so the Arab states haven't uh, done much in the way of advocating on behalf of the Palestinians in the American establishment. Uh, they've had a hard time even getting a hearing, let alone wanting to. Um, clearly, countries like Saudi Arabia and other countries depend on the Israeli military hardware. And so there's a strong synergy between the US military and the US industry with uh, rather totalitarian, non-democratic leaderships in some of these countries, Egypt and Saudi Arabia, for example. Um, so there's a lot more dialogue that needs to take place, which is why we've got to work as closely as we can with Iranian groups and with Arab groups who are committed to, uh, to, to uh, a non-violent answer to the Arab Israeli conflict. You know, there are many, many Muslims who, uh, who are afraid of this agenda. I gave a talk uh, to an Islamic society at Leicester University a week after 9-11. And I said, I think you know what it feels like to be stereotyped. And they were petrified. They were going to be thrown into prison because they were Muslims after 9-11. And I said, well, the Christians in the Middle East feel exactly the same way. They think you think they're all Zionists. They're not. They're followers of Jesus. And Jesus told them to be peacemakers. They're your friends. Uh, let me explain what a, a true Christ follower is. You mustn't think these guys I've described are following Jesus. They've repudiated Jesus' teaching. At the break time, you know, we're having coffee and a man came up to me and then he went away and a woman came up to me and she went away. They both said the same thing. They said, do you think 9-11 is a sign that Jesus is coming back? Now, that week, I hadn't had a single Christian ask me that question with two Muslims on the same day. They have uh, an apocalyptic view of the future in their writings that mirrors how Lindsay, uh, mirrors Tim LaHaye. And um, about that one vision of in your little draft on the end of the world and the hidden rapture and a bunch of stuff that go, that's going on. Where do people come up with that stuff? <laughs> well, I'm Where sorry. I, you know, I don't read okay. my Bible and well, that, and I'm just wondering. You know, there must be a reason why a bunch of have blonde onto that. You get world. you get some passages in Matthew 24, 25, 1 Thessalonians, and. Parts of the book of Revelation. It's the prophetic, apocalyptic writings of Daniel, Ezekiel, Revelation, and bits of, of uh, the Olivet Discourse that they apply in what's called a futurist sense. Uh, our view of eschatology 
there's a variety of ways of understanding these books. Are they historical? So was the Apostle John in Revelation writing about um, his generation? Or is he describing church history? And the problem with that idea is that if, if we were writing, if we were living in the Reformation, we'd only have that much history to deal with. So we, we try and do it chronologically, but now we're living here, we've got to add on another 400 years. So you're always moving the, the, the goalposts. But the futurists have won the day. The futurists say that the prophetic clock stopped ticking in AD 70 when the temple was destroyed and the Jews rejected Jesus. The prophetic clock began in 48 or 67 when Israel uh, became a state or when Jerusalem was. So when Jesus said, this generation will see these things, it's this generation that sees these things. And so Hal Lindsey, writing in 1976, 1980, said this generation is 40 years, 48, 88. Jesus is coming back 1988. Um, then, uh, when it didn't happen, it was okay, 67. So 40 years is 2007. Okay. Um, and then he said, well, a generation could be 40 to 120 years. So conveniently, you always move the goalposts just a little bit more. But that's what they're doing. They're taking Iran now, whereas last year it was Iraq. The year before that it was Kofi Annan. The year before that it was Gorbachev. You know, you just, and people forget. People forget. You know, we're dealing with short-term memory. And, and, the, and cynically, the publishers want to write, and they want a new book, flashy title, provocative, American prophecy, you know, it sells books. That's the level if you like, the theological knowledge of, of and this isn't a, a derogatory statement, but that's the level of, of many Christians' theology. Uh, and and we, we preach over their heads on Sundays. Uh, we need to get it simple. Let me just give you a flavor of what's available. Um, I'll come back to this prayer, but um, the, my book, Christian Zionism, which is, is uh, the cheapest place you can get it is Amazon, Amazon, but don't worry about it ever getting on the bestseller list. Um, it deals with historical roots, theological basis, and political consequences of Christian Zionism. Uh, John Stott, who's a famous British Christian, is, um, is uh, enthusiastic. And, um, and this was Dr. Gilbert Bozikian from, uh, from Wheaton, uh, who was one of the founding pastors of Willow Creek Community Church. Uh, he has solidly got behind this book, which is encouraging. Um, so that's this book, and I commend that to you. Um, if you speak Arabic, it's available in Arabic, um, and this is the new book that's coming out this summer, which takes the middle section, which is the scriptures, and it's a dumbed-down version. It's much simpler. It focuses on how we should read the New Test, the Old Testament, in the light of the New. And I, I'm hoping, and praying that IVP in the States will take it, and because of their evangelical connections, will make uh, a, a, an inroad. Very good website, christianzionism.org is the Institute for the Study of Christian Zionism. There's about seven or eight of us, uh, and it's all that we know of, who are uh, academics at Wheaton or Fuller or uh, North Park in Chicago who are writing on this subject. And we feel a bit like a few of the prophets lost in the wilderness, um, but uh, we are working together to get this on the agenda of churches and my own website, sizes.org, all that I've written is freely available on there at no charge. It's audios, uh, it's video material, PowerPoints, so you can plunder my website to your content on the subject. And on the table is some audio CDs and a text CD of my uh, uh, PowerPoints and, and uh, my PhD thesis. It's one of free PhD, but it's $10, so it's not free, but it's a pretty cheap PhD. Um, so there's some of the resources that are out there, but I recommend christianzionism.org if you really want to find out what people in America are saying about this movement.